Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today is Dr. Jenny Byrne, and I met Dr. Jenny originally through Sabrina Starling, who is just a huge hero of mine, Dr. Sabrina Starling. And Jenny wears multiple hats. She's a co-founder and chief patient officer at Belong Health, and she does coaching through Constellation PLLC. And her debut nonfiction book, Work Smart, Use Your Brain and Behavior to Master the Future of Work, is now available. We'll put a link to it. You can find it at Amazon. Uh, You can also find uh, Dr. Jenny at drjennyburn.com. That's D-R, Jenny, which is J-E-N-N-I-E, burn, B-Y-R-N-E.com. And find her on linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Dr. Jenny Burn, same spelling. So welcome, Dr. Jenny. It's great to see you and congratulations. Thank you. So nice to see you again. So, uh, so you, uh, you put this book out, which is kind of the occasion for getting together. Um, it's been an interesting experience for you. I know that a lot of people who listen may have books or may want to write books. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting because you said it's kind of more of an artistic expression and experience than maybe your typical work is. Um, but Tell me, what was it that made you want to write this book in the first place? Yeah, so I, you know, when um, COVID hit, the pandemic hit, I was like many of you, you know, your listeners, I'm sure, where um, I had been used to being in a pretty traditional office setting and um, quickly had to figure out how to work very differently and had to work remotely at home and have my entire team. I was running a healthcare group at that time. So getting everybody onto telehealth very quickly. So I was really trying to figure it out. And um, I was surprised and disappointed that the information I found online, like it just wasn't really that helpful. I, I, it didn't really give me the answers I was looking for. And I'm sure the answers that your listeners are looking for. So I did what I always do, which is kind of start doing my own research And I'm a brain and behavior specialist. So that was the lens I did the research through is like, if I know this about human brains and human behavior, like how can I figure out for me, for my team, how can we work together? Um, so, So that was really where the research started. And then later on, as the pandemic progressed, you know, I heard a lot of my friends and colleagues saying like, oh, well, you know, we'll just go back to the office like normal. And I started to get really mad. And I was like, why would you want to just go back to your old office? You complained to me about that place like every single day. And you said how you hated it. And now you're just going to go back for another, you know, 10 years, 15 years. You have this opportunity. Like, why on earth are you just going to try to go back to what was not really working for you? So I got kind of, you know, passionate, angry, passionate about it. And then the opportunity came and someone said, would you like to write a book about it? And I was like, you know, very serious, thoughtful, you know, exercise 30 seconds later, I was like, yes, I'll do it. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I got on the journey. Well, so that sounds pretty interesting because I, th- I think that we're still, you know, even this far yes. in still really yeah. struggling with what does it look like? What, you know, so what do you, what is your, what are some of your basic assumptions about what the future of work looks like? And then let's talk a little bit about, you know, give a flavor of what you've got in the book to help us navigate it. Yeah. I think when people think about work, what I realized is that we make a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so when people talk about the future of work, they're normally focusing on technology, like this technology will change work in this way, blah, blah, blah. And I believe that it's really more about all of those old assumptions that we carried that we didn't even know we had. Mm -hmm. So I believe the future of work is actually about being a better human in the workplace and changing the ways we work by unraveling some of those assumptions and making more intentional choices about how we want to work together. Wow. Okay. Well, I think that's very interesting. And I, I, I think that I would tend to agree with that, you know, um, 
one of the things that I think about is that in in a world where we've gone a lot more virtual, mm -hmm. uh, everything's a lot more kind of loosey goosey, and it really comes down, I think, to being a better human in the workplace and being ethical and and uh, committed. And you know, how do you be that, and how do you cause that as a leader? Yeah, and. I think, you know, my, my, my big premise is that what we're all still deeply craving is a sense of human connection yeah. mm -hmm. and empathy, yeah. but we can't get there without the foundation and the building blocks. So in the book, yeah. I start with some of the building blocks, which are time management and communication and communication and John's right up your alley. So yeah. a lot of what you talk about, really, pre, you talked about it pre-pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, in the in-person setting, you know, you talked about how to communicate and you, you framed it through TED, TED Talks, but really it's about how to communicate. Yes, absolutely. And so I think that is still a fundamental building block. Now, what is different, quote unquote, and I would argue it's probably not really different. It's probably been there all along, but- communication now in the virtual world is broken down. You can think about it in terms of synchronous and asynchronous. Yeah. So before we had telephones and computers and internet and email and Slack, we were largely in person together. And so communication was synchronous for the most part, but we, we had newspapers and other, you know, memos right. and things, but now the amount of asynchronous communication has exploded. Yeah, because we have explosion of emails and text and all these other things. So communication, you have to learn what it means to communicate synchronously when you are either in the room together or on video together mm -hmm. or asynchronously when you're not in the same time and place and you're doing written communication or uh, you can do video. You can do other non um non-written forms of asynchronous communication. So yep. I would just encourage your your listeners and other leaders to really think about communication is synchronous and it's asynchronous. And when you're doing the two things, they're very different, right? And when you're, especially like, you know, your, your folks learning how to speak, you talk about it in terms of telling stories. Yeah. How do you tell a story, right? Orally for a TED talk. That's very compelling. And I have a chapter in the book about, you know, synchronous performance is like a performance. It's like a artist communicating with an audience. And if you, it's less sometimes about what we say and more about how we say it and what the person leaving the meeting or the synchronous communication feels or thinks. So if you're yeah. a leader and you're like, well, I'm on video with my team in, in person, you know, either in person or synchronously on video, you should be performing. You should be thinking yep. about what's your audience and how do I want them to walk away from this interaction as opposed to how much content can I cram into their brain, you know, talking to them on a video screen. And so yep. what, if you really think about it, what you can do is shift a lot of your communication to asynchronous and then your synchronous communication is where the really good human connectedness and empathy can come in. So that's yeah. that's kind of how I think about it and, and maybe a helpful framework for some of your leaders. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I have a piece in my training where I talk about how it's not a presentation, it's a performance. Yes. And, uh, and I think that means that you're taking responsibility for their experience and yes. you're thinking exactly like you said, how are they leaving? What are they leaving with? How do they feel after this? Um, right. So, and then I, you know, in asynchronous, yeah, it can be more the logical, the facts and everything. I still think that there's an element of human connection that we can try to bring to our asynchronous communication, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Some of the, so some of the things I talk about are some of the tips and tricks for the asynchronous. So, so first of all, um, I believe to be successful at asynchronous communication, you have to do the time management stuff almost first, because if you're in a situation where many people today are, which I would call like time confetti, this is a term from Bridget Schulte's book, Overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. 
your time is just little tiny pieces, shreds, seconds, you know, thrown around an email, yeah. a Slack, a call, a PowerPoint, you know, and like most people have this like time confetti experience of life mm -hmm. and cognitively your brain, that's terrible for your brain. Yeah. So your brain is very inefficient and it gets exhausted when you do that to it. So the time management piece is creating ways to chunk your time and do like tasks together and get rid of the task shifting, which people call multitasking, which really is a myth. There's no such thing as multitasking for your brain. Yeah. So if you build in those time management skills, then you have longer chunks of time to do quality asynchronous communication. And you can really, again, think about the amount of information you're sharing and how. Yeah. Should it be a video as opposed to an email? Should yep. it be an emoji because I need to express tone very quickly? So maybe I should be using emojis to express tone in my messages in a very concise way. Yep. And you can think about some of the different tips or tricks, but you can't do it unless you have the time. Because if you're just throwing your time around confetti and reacting all the time, like it's going to be very hard to intentionally communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good point. Um, so, so uh, I think you've got some stories about all this. Do you want to share some stories about this stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think um, one of my favorite stories was an interview I did for the book. And this kind of goes back to the first, the beginning of our conversation about assumptions mm -hmm. and how to work together. And um, one of my editors in writing this book was a young woman who was disabled, pretty profoundly disabled in terms of uh, she had cerebral palsy and she had epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant but physically had a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And she talked to me about how the disabled community has been screaming for years, we don't need to come into an office every day to be of value to you. We have so much value, but because of our physical bodies, you know, we are differently able to, or not able to get into an office every day. And so you're ignoring this whole talent pool and we're frustrated because we have things to offer, but we're not able to go in the office. Yeah. And so she was saying, you know, there are all these assumptions before the pandemic about virtual work that wasn't a surprise to her, wasn't a surprise to her friends in the disabled community. They're like, we've been saying this forever. Yeah. And, and, you know, so, so these assumptions were very deeply bound and um, she has found now the, silver lining of the pandemic for her and her community and the disabled community has been that people are finally wising up to what they've been saying all along. And so for them, the opportunities, their work opportunities have exploded because now so many more companies are willing to see their value as an employee who can't come into a physical building. And so it's been wonderful in some ways for them and, and just given her so many options. So I love that story because it just goes to show that we we've just been making assumptions. Yeah. And it's not like this is actually a new thing. It's just new for most of us. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point. I mean, I, I've, uh, I was in the internet space since, you know, 1987. Yeah, you were an early uh, adapter. So, you know, virtual work and remote work just was part of my whole career. Um, and, you know, I think the interesting thing and the hard thing and maybe the good thing is that the pandemic forced everybody to learn how to do that all at once, all together. Yeah. Right. And so and that happened really fast and a lot of us didn't have experience in it. So, of course, it's still a work in progress. Right. Yeah. Oh, we're totally a work in progress. And I think you see it's very heated right now. Some people are like, we should just go back to the office and everything will be fine. And um, I would, again, offer to leaders who are feeling that way that, yes, it may be the right answer for you and your culture to be together every day. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be some companies that is their culture and that's the right thing for them. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of people, um, research shows most people prefer flexibility where you're not actually in a building together physically every single day of the week. Um, so another really interesting story I tell I learned from researching the book was that our model of the traditional office comes from a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Before that, it was totally different. It all comes from the Ford factory floor. Yeah. Back in the early 1900s, right? Before that, work didn't look like the way it does now. So the factory floor basically had human beings as part of a assembly line. So humans are kind of like robots mm -hmm. in the assembly line. Yep. And and it was nine to five at the time. That was actually very humane because people were working like yeah. 18 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. So the nine to five was actually seen as like a very humane way to have people work. Um, and so that nine to five schedule, that assembly line mentality kind of got baked in. And then as the Ford factory was very successful, the management grew. And so they had to put the manager somewhere to watch the floor. So right. what did they do? They build another floor. Yeah. Right. Above. And then the managers could watch the floor and then it grew and then they built another floor and then another yeah. one. Right. And so then you get this kind of corporate structure like we have today where, you know, you got their CEO up on the top floor and then you got all your cubicles and this feeling of human beings as robots, I think really started to grow and post-war America really reinforced that. Yeah. So again, what I think people are craving now, I think people don't want to feel like robots anymore. I think we want to feel like yeah. human beings. Yeah. And the current, the traditional office was really designed to make us operate more like robots. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so so uh, let's talk a little bit more. Do you have any other thoughts about just how you know, what does this put the focus on in terms of communication now that, you know, now that we're in this? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, if you master your time, if you get better at time management, you carve out more mental time and space for yourself to be a better communicator. And then if you can learn some of the tips or tricks about communicating in a hybrid or virtual world, then you get to the good stuff, which is the empathy part and the connectedness part. And one of the big assumptions I've seen recently, and I tell a story about my own experience. So I'm a psychiatrist. So I've done psychotherapy for you know over 15 years. So I was mm -hmm. trained in psychotherapy, right? I've had years of training and years of experience. And psychotherapy is all about empathy. So I've had kind of as much training as any human being probably could have on how to be empathetic. Yeah. So fast forward, you know, in the pandemic, I'm doing video meetings. I'm trying to figure it out like everybody else. And um, I really struggled with my empathy, you know, and I found that like I wasn't being empathetic. By the end of the day, I was crabby and, you know, I had hit my empathy ceiling and I had forgotten yeah. what I knew from years ago, which is that we all have limits to empathy. Yeah. So empathy is not unlimited. <laughs> Right. Um, we all have, and, and different people have different amounts, whatever's going on in your life. If you got a lot going on in your life, maybe your empathy is a little low. Yeah. If you're yeah. having a great day and you're on top of the world and you're healthy and it's sunny outside, you know, maybe your empathy is high that day. And as a leader, you really have to think about how to choose where you're going to give your empathy because you can't always give it every way, you know, to everybody every day, all day long. Right. You just can. And it was a very hard lesson for me to relearn as a leader that I knew I just wasn't doing it, which is I had to garner my own energy and my own health and all that stuff, because otherwise there's no way I could show up and be empathetic the way I needed to be as a leader. So I yeah. think if I were to give your listeners a takeaway who are trying to be better leaders, don't be so hard on yourself and expect that you can just be empathetic all day long to everybody. Yeah. Like figure out what is your limits and what can you do to take care of yourself? What can you do to choose the right people or the right situation to apply your empathy? Maybe the right time of day. Yeah. You know, for me after 3 PM, you know, it's not good. I, try, I really am not great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so as a leader, don't be so hard on yourself and don't expect that you can just have this unlimited empathy. I'm telling you as somebody who is trained in empathy, who has done it for years and it's like kind of my, it was my whole job in a way, like I ran out of empathy and yeah. the pandemic was hard on everybody. And even now I think, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. So, so understand what your limits are, how you can take care of yourself and then choose where you're going to be empathetic. 
I mean, it, you know, it is interesting because the one of the things that really has come up for me with a, a lot of the people that I work with is this element of self-care. Because, yeah. you know, the, the upside is you can work from anywhere. The downside is that you can work all the time, everywhere, yeah. you know, like, so to have those limits, to have some boundaries and to really prioritize self-care, I think that's just become vastly more important because it's also, I think at the same time, kind of become harder. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, my lesson I relearned is that I am a human being. Mm -hmm. I have a human body. I have relationships. I have stuff at my house. I have, you know, and we all do. And we were just all pretending that we were these little robots that showed up and all that went away. And it's, it was delusional, frankly, to think mm. that like an employee doesn't have a human body and a human brain and all of that. Yeah. So uh, the more leaders can accept that they're human and that their teams are human and how do you work with other human? And then let robots do robot stuff. If you have tasks that a robot can do, let the robot do that. Right. You know, and so I think at this point, self-care is almost table stakes for a leader. And then building your own self-awareness and your own empathy skills and your active listening skills and all that, um, that, that can all come once you've done the self-care. Yeah. So if you're not taking care of yourself, you're never going to get, honestly, you're just never going to do that stuff. You're not going to be good at it Yeah. because your, your brain and your body is, is not ready to take on those challenges. Yeah. You know, um, it, it kind of brings up another piece that I've been, you know, trying to bring out in leaders for a long time. And the pandemic, I think really accelerated it, which is just that, you know, the integration of, your whole self. And I yes. always feel like genuinely great leaders integrate their whole self into that role. It, and you know, that means some vulnerability. It means some uh, humanity. It means personal stories, yeah. what matters to you sharing all that, all those things. And that I think is really important for great leadership period. And I think it's, again, it just, the need for that has been just massively amplified. Yeah. Because you are human, whether you want to believe it or not and sharing your mess yeah. is, is part of what makes you human and good leaders, especially people have been doing it for a while, you know, not fresh out of school. People have been doing this for a while. You, you have messes to share yeah. and there's a lot of value in that. And I think you'd asked me at the beginning about writing a book. And for me, one of the most vulnerable things has been putting my stories in the book. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of stuff I'm still a little nervous about. You know, I think about, wow, the, people don't know this about me. Like, like one example was at my office, there was a, I would dress a certain way, right. To feel very professional and that involved heels. And we had a fire drill and I fell down a flight of stairs Ow. in my heels with a patient who was oh. with me in my office. So, you know, that's a mess, right? Yeah, that was a hot right. mess. Yeah. So I share that or, you know, I realized that there's a lot about me that I was not sharing and I was being very like, for example, people don't know that I'm a musician. I started college as a music performance major and nobody knew that about me. Yeah. And it was like, wow, why didn't I ever share that. And it was because I felt like that would be, I don't know, negative. If I didn't say, oh, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, that like somehow I would be worse at my job or right. they wouldn't take me seriously. Or So little things like that become like synthesizing little bits. It's hard. It's really hard, especially if you've been in a very professional setting where maybe you were taught that was wrong or you're worried about like how that will look. And so it's, I think that's really hard actually. Yeah. Well, you know, in my, in my training, I, one of the, one of the best ways to connect with and inspire people comes from a guy named Les Brown. He says, people mm -hmm. don't connect with your successes. They connect with your yes. messes. Your message is in your mess. And I call that, you know, I'm putting a TM on it. Um, I call that insightful vulnerability because it's not just, mm -hmm. oh, 
here's my hot mess. I'm such a hot mess. Oh, it's yes. here's my hot mess and what I learned from it. Here's the insight, right? Yeah, it's the same. You know, and when you work with patients, sharing sometimes, you know, people think that a therapist can never disclose anything about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes, again, you can share things with an insight. Patients don't want to hear your life is a hot mess. That's not very yeah. reassuring to them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as a leader, it, you know, if you give a laundry list of how your life is a hot mess, that's not going to reassure your team. Right. But it is more that sharing with the insight or I think giving them a heads up if you're not in a good place one day for some reason that it's not about them. Because yeah. if you don't tell them, if you can't keep it inside because something's gone on with you and you don't say anything, people are going to assume it's about them. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes if you say, hey, guys, like if I'm not 100 percent with you today, I just got some stuff going on. I just wanted to let you know I might be a little bit distracted at the moment, then that's a vulnerability that makes people feel reassured because they know it's not about them. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I th it's super important. So, so tell me, uh, you know, you and I are both fans of just like how the brain works. Tell me a little bit of, you know, from that perspective, you've already mentioned some of it, like we can't confetti time doesn't work. Right. right. What are some of the other insights from the brain point of view about how we're working now? Well, one of my favorite insights I got early on when I was researching has to do with video yeah. and how our brains process uh, the televideo platforms that we're using today. So there's some great tips that come out of that. So first of all, um, your brain has face cells. So the cells in your brain are called neurons. Some neurons are specifically attuned to human faces. Yeah. So... Um, when you do televideo calls and you do Hollywood Square style and you have like 20 faces looking uh -huh. at you from different A, your brain is like on high alert, like this is really weird. My face cells are like very confused and that's why you're so exhausted. Yeah. So a very simple thing, for example, would be don't do that. Like maybe the beginning you come on and you do Hollywood Squares for like 30 seconds to see everybody. Um, and then go on to speaker mode. Yeah. Okay. So you only see one face at a time. Now, if you're presenting as a performance, you might want to see everybody. That's a little bit of a nuance. Yeah. Another thing about the brain is we have mirror cells. So not only do we have cells that respond to human faces, we also mirror other human behaviors. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So when you're on video with somebody and you have your self view, so you, seeing yourself, you cannot not look at yourself. It's impossible not to look at yourself, right? Because you have these these mirror neurons and these face neurons. So whenever possible, turn yourself off. It's a very practical tip. Try to turn yourself off because it's yeah. very confusing to your brain. And then the final tip I learned about how brains process this video is if you sit close to a video monitor, like many people use um, a laptop, which is pretty small. Yep. Um, if you sit close, like if I come up, my brain thinks I'm in that box and I stop moving and my body gets kind of rigid and I'm very unnatural. If I sit more than an arm's length away, my brain sees the rest and I'm not in the box anymore and my body yeah. language will become much more natural and fluid. So a very practical tip is get away, you know, Step back from your monitor so that your brain understands that you're not in that box. Yeah, that's very good. That's good for you. And the good news is that uh, I read some research that showed that people respond much better to you on video if they can see a little bit of your torso, your shoulders, your exactly. upper body. Exactly. Because it's very unnatural to have somebody like this. Yeah. I mean, if you think about in person, if you had somebody that close to you, talking to you for yeah. like 30 minutes, it would freak you out. Like it would feel very unnatural. Yeah. That's what I'm always trying to do when I'm on video is make it seem as much like we're just sitting face to face as I can make it. Perfect. And that's a very practical thing that, again, you can understand how your brain works and very practically use that application or turn the video off, start the media meeting on to say hi to everybody. And then if you're going to share something or whatever, just say, Hey, we're going to go off video. We'll come back on at the end. 
Yeah. Just go off and give people a break. The other really interesting little detail I learned about video is that people who feel very scrutinized in the office, so Uh typically women, uh, underrepresented groups, people of color, find uh, televideo calls exhausting because the they feel very scrutinized yeah. for their appearance. And so giving them permission or others who feel scrutinized to take their video off for periods of time sometimes is really helpful for them. That's great, yeah. You know, I mean, because I do think it's really important to be able to see each other in those meetings. And, you know, I like the idea of saying, okay, we'll take, we'll take, you know, we'll go through this. You can turn your video off blah, 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 and then we'll all come back on video again. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good move. Or stretch. If you're on a long mm-hmm. thing, say, let's go off video so everybody can stand up for yeah. a minute or move around. Like it's not healthy for the human body to be glued to a chair. Yeah. And then the time management piece, right? Like make the meet, make sure you have buffers between appointments. Yeah. You know, when I did therapy, I always had a 10 minute. There's a reason therapy appointments are 50 minutes long. Yeah. You need a buffer to get up and move your body, to mentally compose yourself, to gather whatever you need to do. Like most people fall into this default of, again, because there's just an assumption that meetings have to be 30 minutes. Like where did that come from? They can be five minutes. They can be 15 minutes. Give yourself chunks of time. Don't go back to back. I mean, that's just really bad for your body, yeah. honestly. Yeah, I probably need to take that more to heart, that particular one right there. It's hard because everybody assumes that you always, you know, par- uh, Parkinson's law, you always use the time allotted. Yeah, right. So if you book 30 minutes, it's going to go 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So don't book 30 minutes. Yeah. That's funny. Well, so, um, so say a little bit more about, uh, you know, because you were, we were talking earlier about the fact that, and I think it's become clear in our conversation, but just to put a pin in it, um, Mm -hmm. the future of work, people think a lot about technology and this technology and that technology, and here's what's coming and here and all that. And what can we do with technology? But in your book, I think that you are, you know, you're, I might say it, that you're focused on the human aspect, which ultimately is, I think, even more important because it's the humans that are going to be using the technology, right? Exactly. And I'm super pro robot. I think we should all have helper robots Uh because helper robots let us be more human. Yeah. So I think maybe if you call it tech enablement, so you're enabling human beings to be good human beings and have that connectedness, that is what we all kind of want. Let the robots do the robot stuff so that we can do the human stuff. And uh, the example I give is um, like Lyft and Uber. Yeah. The, The robot part has taken over scheduling directions and payment. And so the driver's job is now to make you happy. Yeah. And that could be either sitting quietly and doing nothing, or it could be chatting, or it could be a clean car, or it could be giving you a drink. Or, yeah. Like their job is now human to human. How can I make you feel the way you want to feel? Yeah. And we give them stars and we incentivize them to be good humans. Yeah. So that's a great example. Like let the robots do the robot stuff. Let the drive, the human driver do the human stuff. Yeah. That's fabulous. Um, so so in the time we have left, I would love to make sure that I give you an opportunity to just, you know, anything that I didn't ask, anything that you think's really important we haven't gone over yet. What is there anything like that? I just think leaders in particular, I hear a lot of people, you know, you talk about either burnout or moral injury or just honest, like your body is tired. Yeah. <laughs> Like people are still tired. And when you hear about some of these ideas about communicating or this, they sound like a lot of work. And they're like, why should I spend the time and energy to do this thing? Mm. Let me just do what I'm doing. I, I, it doesn't, I don't like it, but I at least don't have to put in any more effort. Yeah. And, and I think I would challenge the audience and others to think about 
a small investment in some very pragmatic things you can do has a pretty dramatic impact on how you feel. And, and the startup I've been working with, for example, this is a lot of what I do there is help build these things in. Yeah. And it's pretty dramatic. Like it feels pretty different and it feels a lot better when you can make some small changes. So I think my challenge is to don't work harder, Yeah. work smarter. Yeah. So sometimes that means working less, right? Sometimes it means getting out of work because that will make your work better. Mm. Sometimes it means taking a walk in the middle of the day. Yeah because that will take care of your body and then you'll show up better for your team. And I, I would just have people challenge their assumptions yeah. because a small investment, I've seen it yield really great results. So I guess I'm, I'm challenging everyone out there to think a little bit differently and put in a little bit of thought and, and have fun, like experiment and try some things that are a little different with your team and say, hey, this week we're going to try an experiment. You know, Dr. Jenny, I heard her say we should try to get off video in the middle of our call. Let's just try it and see what happens. Like, you know, have a little fun, do some experiments and see what happens. And then let me know. You know, I'd love to hear how people are experimenting and what they're finding because I'm still learning too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we all are. Um, we still jump on Zoom and start to talk when we're on mute, right? <laughs> so I know, it's crazy. We all still do that once in a while, like how many years later? Yeah. Well, so Dr. Jenny, we're going to put links to your website and your book and your, your LinkedIn um, into the show notes. And I, I think that what you're talking about in your book makes tons of sense. And I think that you've done a great job of kind of collecting it all and putting it in a digestible format. And I think it will really forward people's action in this new still kind of coalescing sort of weird world of work. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And again, I'm, I hope people are inspired. There's a little bit of science in there. There's a lot about work and there's a lot about how we can make it better. And I do believe if we take these steps now, personally, we're going to enjoy work better, but I think we can make it a more equitable workplace as well. And so that's maybe a little bit of a deeper message. If you are willing to take a couple actions, I think we can get to a much more equitable workplace. Yeah. Well, that's fabulous. And I deeply appreciate you taking your time to join me here on speak like a leader dot show. And to those of you listening, thank you for taking the time to join us here. And if you like the show, please share it with someone. And if you would be willing to give us a five star rating, and uh, give some good comments that would potentially help us reach new listeners better and get the message out even further. And Dr. Jenny, thanks again for joining me here on Speak Like a Leader Show. Thank you, John, and thank you for your book, which was a big inspiration for me as well. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome, and glad to hear that. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go. Be awesome.